Interesting. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm Deborah Jackson from CSU Bakersfield. I've been asked uh, by Cafe Learn to talk about uh, formative and uh, uh, adaptive assessments for student mastery. Um, I have not used Cafe Learn uh, in my courses, um, but I'm very excited about what Cafe Learn can offer. What I plan to do today was to talk a little bit about uh, using formative and uh, adaptive assessment in my classes and a little bit about backward course design for thinking about how I've redesigned my class and then uh, uh, giving you some, perhaps inspiring you to think about uh, using some of these tools for your courses. Um, uh, assessment something we're all pretty familiar with. Um, uh, most of us think about assessment in terms of accreditation. Um, but here I want to talk about assessment in general terms, uh, a process designed to improve student learning. Um, most of the time when we're thinking about assessment, we're thinking about it in the summative sense, the way that you use assessment to give an evaluative stum summary uh, of students' abilities at the end of a course or a program. Uh, this tends to be where we're using assessment for accreditation purposes or at the end of our courses or maybe even a senior capstone, something like that, for the end of a program. The focus I want to uh, 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 draw your attention to today is using formative assessment. Uh, this is also something we do all the time in our classes. We just may not always call it assessment. Um, and that is we want to give feedback to students to improve what it is, the skills that they have, what, what their learning is in the middle of a course so that they can hopefully get to the end of our course more successfully. Uh, than the track, the path they may be on at the time. Adaptive assessment is a pretty new term for me, uh, and I'm very excited about what Cafe Learn can offer around adaptive assessment. The idea here is that the assessment is tailored uh, to what the student can do. So you offer more challenging activities for students who are doing really well, and you offer less challenging activities for students who are struggling. Why would we want to do this? Well, because if the, if the assessment, do, if the, the tasks don't match the student's abilities, the students who are doing really well, who are getting it really easy, they're going to get really uh, bored, right? They're going to check out. They're going to think the class is a waste of time. The students who are struggling, if the, if the material is too challenging for them, they're going to check out because they don't think that they can attain the standards, right? Um, and so you lose people. If you can match the assessment to the student's level of ability, just slightly more challenging than what they can do, they get an opportunity to see their own improvement and step up without checking out. <clears throat> um, when I first started teaching, and even now, uh, I want to use this traditional course design. When I first started at CSUB, Kay Bragg was the uh, director of the Faculty Teaching and Learning Center. And I went to every single workshop she offered because I was trying to figure out how to be a good teacher. And every time she would tell me that I was designing my courses wrong, I would use this traditional course design. And even now, when I'm told, uh, here's your teaching assignment for the fall, this is what I go to. This is my go-to. I first look at the course title. Ah, oh, that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, that's, what I'm, that's what my class is about. Then I go to the course description. That's what I need to teach. Then I go and shop around for some textbooks. And I find a book, some books that I want to teach. And then I figure out how many weeks there are in the quarter. And then I design, you know, lay out, plot out what the reading assignments are for that quarter. And then I go, OK, about halfway through the quarter, I'll put a, a, a midterm. At the end, I'll put a final. I don't know, throw a couple quizzes in there. Oh, what else am I grading this quarter? I'll move things around so I don't get all my grading at once, figure out what my vacation days are, when I know to go to, go to conferences. And there, bam, my syllabus is done, right? Anybody else do that? Yeah, that's what I do. And Kay told me, and I, I, uh, her, her, her voice is in my brain at all times, like, that's not what you want to do as a teacher. That's not what the best teachers do. What the best teachers do is something more like a backward course design. You think not about what you are going to do, but what you want the students to be able to do. You start with the learning outcomes. Now, we are, most of us, I think, are here because we want, we're, we're thinking about general education teaching. 
And learning outcomes for gen ed are pretty straightforward for us in the CSU. We have an executive order that tells us what students need to learn in their general education program. Uh, no matter which campus you're from, whether you, because uh, uh, we're a 23 campus system, and the course that fulfills your, your requirement on your campus should fill the same requirement on my campus. We need to create some kind of common learning experiences for students across the campuses, and that's what the learning outcomes can do. If your, your campus should also have some kind of interpretation of this, the chancellor's office's executive order, um, and that's where I start from my, from my class. I teach, um, I teach uh, critical thinking, an A3 course at CSUB. I've been teaching it a long time, trying to figure out how to improve student learning in this class. I'm guessing this is probably the case on your campuses too, but on my campus, this A3 requirement can create quite a bottleneck. Students have trouble with their uh, A3 course and it kind of gets backed up. And so I'm really, really, I've been trying to figure out how to, um, how to improve student learning, not to uh, reduce my course expectations, right? Um, so start with the learning outcomes. This should be really straightforward from you, for you, whether it's from the executive order or your campus's interpretation of that in their GE program. Then you want to figure out what evidence the students need to demonstrate to, uh, to show that they've accomplished that learning outcome. Um, uh, these uh, in Cafe Learn are called performance expectations. These are the smaller skills the, that, uh, that, that when you accumulate them, give evidence of that learning outcome. And from there, you want to plan the learning experiences. What then, right, once you figure out what you want the students to do, then you think about how can I be in the service of my students to help them build the skills to, sh to, to show the things that I want them to show me. Um, and uh, then you figure out what your syllabus looks like there at the end. Um, are you all pretty familiar with backward course design? Has anybody heard of that before? A couple nods? Yeah, yeah. If, hmm? Oh, great. Awesome. Awesome. So um, uh, this, this particular book I would recommend if you want to learn more about it, Understanding by Design. Um, it's, a, it's a great resource for thinking about designing your courses using this uh, method. So how, how does assessment fit into backward course design? Well, you again begin with the learning outcomes. Think, setting your performance expectations is going to be where the summative assessment happens. This is the, what you want the students to show at the end, right? Um, and then, sorry about the yellow. I should have thought about that color when I chose it. Um, from there, you want to then figure out what the learning experiences are going to be. What is going to happen in the classroom or outside of the classroom for the students to be able to build the skills, to uh, uh, acquire the knowledge so that they can then demonstrate to you in those graded assignments that they've met the outcomes. That's where formative and adaptive assessment comes in. Um, when we think about being teachers in the classroom, I think that we often, uh, or at least I know that I do, I think about what it was like to be a student. And as a student, I had an instructor lecture, and I took notes, and then I took a test, and that was it. Um, and so that's my go-to for thinking about being a teacher. But I've been thinking more and more about other kinds of teachers that I had. Um, not only was I a student at, in an elementary, in a high school, in a, a university, but I was also a student in a dance class and a student in a music class. And in these classes, uh, or maybe you were an athlete, I didn't pick, this is the kind of athleticism that's in my past. Other people play basketball or, uh, uh, or take, a, take a language class or something like that. But this is my go-to. And in these classrooms, when I learned about ballet, my ballet instructor didn't stand in front of the room and give us a lecture about the history of ballet or you know, the, the development of Tchaikovsky's music or the, how many performances of Black Swan there have been in the history of uh, 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 ballet. When I took music classes and learned how to, how to play the clarinet, uh, my instructor didn't give me an anatomy lesson on the clarinet, right? Instead, they put these tools in our, the instructors put these tools in our hands or put our bodies at the bar and we practiced and we practiced. So I've been um, uh, thinking about deliberate practice as a, a, a technique for teaching, for bringing into my classroom. What I want to do is get 
create learning experiences that allow students to perform the things that I want them to do with full concentration and intentionally focused on improvement. They're not there to be spectators in my classroom, right? It's not like going to the movies, right? They need to be doing something. They need to be engaged and thinking about what they're learning and why they're learning it. The difficulty level of what the activity needs to match what it is that I want them to do so that they don't check out, either because it's too hard or too easy. And this is what I think Cafe Learn can offer through its fast forward and rewind feature, is a way of using adaptive assessment to match the task to the student's ability. We need to give them close guidance and timely, accurate feedback on their performance. This can be very, very challenging in very large classrooms. And using learning management systems or platforms like uh, Cafe Learn can give you more opportunities to give students feedback if you build in exercises into Cafe Learn that are graded automatically that give them feedback. Here's what it is. You, you got these questions right? Awesome, right? High five yourself. You got these wrong? That suggests you're having trouble with this. Now go back. Learn some more about that. And uh, finally, and this is super important in my class, which is that students need repeated opportunities to perform the same or similar tasks. The first time they are asked to do a task shouldn't be on their final exam, right? They need to be given chances to do it over and over and over again so that they get really, really good at it, just like in the ballet class where you, you, know, you lift your leg 20 times in a row uh, so that you get your perfect stance, right? Uh, so that then when you perform at the end of the season, uh, you perform the recital, your leg knows exactly where to go when you lift it. Does that make sense? The last time I went over, so I'm going really, really fast this time. Y'all okay? All right. Questions so far? Uh, yeah. Take a quick copy of the presentations in each room? Um, that sounds great. I'd be happy. Digital email. Uh, nobody's let me know that that's available, but I'd be happy. Okay, we can make that happen. Yes, be happy to do that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so what I want to do is show you a little bit about how I've taken the course that I've built and you uh, try to use Cafe Learn to show the things that I'm trying to accomplish. Um, again, I haven't used Cafe Learn myself in my classes. I use, I, I've done this all in Blackboard. So I've just, um, uh, the Cafe Learn folks have imported pieces of my Blackboard course into Cafe Learn so that you can see what is possible with their uh, platform. Through it a little bit and then we can see it on the screen. So at the top of this, I, I have two, two windows open here. Uh, both of them are student views of the course. Um, in my course, uh, I took the learning outcomes for A3 and consolidated some of them. I think there are like a dozen, consolidated them down to eight, um, eight learning outcomes. And I have a uh, assessment, a summative assessment associated with each one of those learning outcomes. Um, so a test um, and, or a paper. And then, um, and then I've taken those learning outcomes and identified smaller pieces that compose that learning outcome. In, in Cafe Learn, those are called performance expectations. So the one I'm gonna work, walk you through is the second sort of meta outcome. It's analyzing arguments. Students need to, uh, uh, one of the learning outcomes is that students will be able to analyze arguments. And um, I have broken that down into smaller, smaller steps Students need to be able to identify premises and conclusions. They need to be able to sort those out from claims that are extra, that aren't part of the arguments. They need to be able to tell, identify when those uh, claims are implied. Um, here's the, so here they uh, need to identify issues and conclusions, the premises, extra claims, Premises and conclusions that are implied by non-claims. They need to be able to analyze arguments with multiple conclusions and chain arguments. And then finally, there at the end, um, I ask them to write a critical praise. So they put all of those skills together in a single writing assignment. Um, this works really well in my class because the skills are scaffolded. If they can't do the first one, they're not going to be able to do the last one. If they can't recognize arguments, they can't evaluate them. 
Um, and, and so uh, I've, I've built it this way. For this student, um, the first activities are for the student to do some reading. So I have a link here to the reading. Um, and then I have uploaded a video, a lecture video, for the students to watch. That way my class is entirely flipped. I don't need to use any class time to lecture to them. They can instead watch the video once, twice, over and over again. Uh, some students say that they like, who are commuting, <coughs> say that they play it on their phone while they're driving, so it's like an audio book. Um, and then after the student has uh, completed those activities, I invite them to take a readiness quiz. And this quiz looks to see where they are. How well can they do all of those performance, or almost all of the performance expectations that I've set for them? This particular student, uh, I had her take the readiness quiz, and she got 100%. She nailed it the first time, which then lets me know I don't need to ask her to spend more time practicing. Right? She'd get bored out of her skull. What does she want to do? She wants to go do more challenging activities. So here I've set up fast forward activities for her. Uh, one is um, what I call a one step further. Here I've built in a link to change.org, which is an online site for petitions. Um, that people can, anyone can author and post onto change.org. This particular petition I've linked up for her is, uh, regards the movie Django Unchained. Do you all remember this? Quentin Tarantino, a couple years ago. Some folks were very upset because as part of the marketing for this movie, they had turned the characters into dolls or action figures. So you could go buy some slave dolls for your uh, action figure collection. And uh, this, the author of this petition was asking uh, the manufacturer to stop producing those dolls. The students are, who are uh, able to do these skills really well, I can send them out to a real world application to look at this petition and analyze the argument. The person who put together the petition, does she offer good reasons for stopping the manufacturing of these dolls or not? Um, and to use those skills not on a textbook exercise or one I've created for, um, for my test, but one out there in the world and uh, get some feel for doing this out on the, uh, a real world application of that skill set. Does that make sense? And then I've sent her to uh, that final step, step seven, writing a critical precy. This other student, um, Here, when uh, this student took the readiness quiz, he had some trouble. So what, um, what I've done is built in, this is, uh, this is what, what I would want to do is give him feedback. He missed this first question, so I want to give him feedback. The fact that he missed this question suggests to me that he's having trouble identifying conclusions. He needs more practice. So I then want to direct him to activities that are going to allow him to build on those skills. The things that he got right, he doesn't need to practice those. He only needs to practice the part he's having trouble with. So here I'm telling him that he needs practice identifying conclusions. And I've built in here for him what they call rewind activities. So he's having trouble uh, identifying conclusions, so I'm going to point him to another lecture, a video, uh, that gives him more tips. You're having trouble identifying conclusions, let me give you some tips. Use inference indicators, and let me show you how to do this in this video. And then some more exercises that are directed only to identifying conclusions so he can get more practice on that. Does that make sense? The way that I've built my class, um, I give students on formative assessment unlimited opportunities to practice those activities. I want them to do them over and over again, just like I did in my ballet class, until they get mastery. And I tell them, do, you, know, you finish it. If you don't get the grade that you want, right? you get a 50, you don't want that grade. <laughs> do it again, do it again, do it again. 
practice, you know, learn, review, this, review the lectures and then practice some more. Review and practice until you're consistently getting an A or a B and that lets you know, good job, I'm ready to move on. Yes? Uh, so how can you predict the level of the uh, proficiency of your student at the beginning? Because you don't know how, you can predict how much you would, would be your options of yeah. back and forth. Or yeah, so for, for, for me, this is something that I would not recommend for someone who's taught teaching a class the very first time. Mm -hmm. um, this is something I've developed over 13 years of teaching this particular class, multiple sections every single year. Um, so I have a pretty good sense of what students who are freshmen and sophomores are able to do in this class. I've got a, I've got a lot of um, uh, suggestions and sort of shortcuts and tips and stuff like that that I can build in for, for them. Um, and so I've gradually, gradually each year, like, oh, they're having trouble with that? I need to build a video or I need to find a resource or I need to build more exercises. What I have are thousands and thousands of exercises that I've pull, pooled together in these banks so that the, each time the student takes this quiz, it's a different set of questions. Every time they all get different questions. It just randomly gives them to them. Yeah. Yeah. So you created a thousand um, different exercises. How long, um, how much upfront time do you spend, say, for a module for a week and the overall support? Because when I, I see this, I'm thinking it takes about you know, a week and a half or so for the first course to go through and create all these quizzes, activities to this level. Is that a fair assessment or am I actually underestimating it? You're underestimating the workload. <laughs> you're underestimating the workload. It is a lot of work, which is why I said, like, this has been over, over years. So um, I didn't start trying to create the whole thing at once. I started a little bit at a time. Um, a couple years ago, I got a grant from the CSU, a promising course redesign grant that gave me a course release. And I also hired a student assistant to type in questions for me. <laughs> um, uh, so it took, it's, it's a, 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 lo a huge investment, but you don't have to do it all at once. Right? You can take one piece and, and try it out. You could, you could just start with creating fast forward and rewind activities in Cafe Learn for the students in your class and you just respond to them right there. You have somebody struggling, you say, you know what? Guess what, you're struggling on this? I've got some stuff for you. Let me show you some extra help. Or you're nailing it, that you're bored? Hey, let me show you something that might engage your attention a little better. This is a one course that I've redesigned. Yeah, this is one. Yeah. Yeah. How many outcomes did you uh, start with? I have eight learning outcomes. Eight. eight. Specific. Yes. And are they kind of macro outcomes or are they very specific? They're very specific. So they, students can recognize arguments, they can identify conclusions and premises, they can diagram arguments, they can evaluate inductive arguments, evaluate deductive, you know. They're broad enough that it gives me some choice. If I get tired of evaluating categorical arguments, we can do truth functional ones instead, you know. Um, but they're, they're pretty specific, yeah. That way. Exactly, exactly. And, and because the skills are scaffolded, um, I'm able to reuse some of the same exercises. Because I can take an exercise and ask the, ask the student to recognize that argument. The next time they work with it, they're analyzing it. The next time they work with it, they're evaluating it. So I can reuse some of those, but I'm just asking them to do different things depending on their skill level at that point. Yeah. So say you have student A and student B, one student excelling in the course and the other person is struggling. So when you, how do you identify, do you go like through the back door and say, okay, this person got a 50, so then you manually redirect or do you build it in so it automatically redirects into the proper activities? So the way that I've been doing this is manually. Blackboard allows me to click on that individual student and I can look and see what pages did they visit, how many times did they take that quiz, what scores did they get when they took it. What Cafe Learn offers you are analytics that will do that work for you. Okay. They can give you the picture on the individual student, where they are, how they're doing. They could give you the course as a whole, how they're doing. You could take one of the learning outcomes and see how everybody's doing. Um, so that's one of the things I'm excited about Cafe Learn is I could click a button and boom, there's the information I've been looking for that's taken me a little bit more work. 
to uh, manually go in for each student. So I'm kind of excited about this well, feature. The other nice thing is like if someone takes an assessment and it's a 50 on that, for example, that it'll automatically populate that rewind content just for those students that got 50. Oh. And then it'll automatically populate that fast forward content for, for students that got 50. Yeah, which is cool because that saves me some time yeah. and allows me to just be responsive to the student in front of me. Yeah. yeah. Somebody else? Yes. Uh, I think I would just throw one follow up with this one. Is there any additional feature on top of the one? Uh, it's like uh, we talked about assessments, talked about the kind of giving the feedback by each of the changes to the one, let's say with the 50 requirement. Uh, any other unique features on top of the one? Um, um, Yes, so Cafe Learn also has these um, group discussion possibilities. So you can uh, uh, find students who are working on something together. Like say, you say out of your whole class, you have a dozen students that are stuck on one thing. You can group them together and have them work on something together and populate them into like a discussion board that you can monitor and participate in that nobody else is involved in. I haven't used that feature, but I think it's got a lot of potential. Yes. Something kind of like peer to peer is supposed to also let the instructor to kind of customize, to kind of learn from other instructors. So right. if you populate your very nice code design to Cafe Learn, yes. uh, so means you automatically be able to share that with other instructors? Well, what they've told me is that you can choose what you share, okay. which is important, right, for intellectual property concerns. Right, so um, in, at, at CSUB, with folks in my program, we might wanna co co collaborate on building the pieces of Cafe Learn, and, and I might wanna put pieces in that somebody else doesn't, but maybe somebody else who wants to build a course like this doesn't wanna enter all 2,000 of the exercises or recreate those, we can share it, right? I can say, I'll share my test banks, but you gotta promise to add some to it, right? Um, so, so I get some benefit, and we can do that together, which I think is super cool um, if you have multiple sections of a course that are just bread and butter for your program. Yeah. Um, this is probably not a question directed to you, but maybe a Cafe Learn person. Is it true there doesn't seem to be any content on the <coughs> Cafe Learn? I know when I tried to design my course, there was like nothing out there. Um, and, and if you're starting from scratch, as I would be, it sounds like Cafe Learn is a wonderful thing if you've got the thousand exercises, but if you've got 1.7 exercises and now you've got to populate <laughs> this massive thing yeah. uh, and you don't know how to do it, and if someone misses multiple choice question number four, you've got to figure out, well, why did they get that wrong? Yeah. Well, then they need to do this. You know, I'll make a number up and say it's exaggerated. Uh, 500 hours to do that. Yeah. Um, is that is that true? I mean, has anyone actually designed a full course on Cafe Learn? you want me to get? I think that you have yeah. this, this resource, right, that you were oh, yeah. showing me. One, yeah. one of the differences that we, we make, we have, we have all the people on the project where we use the Cafe Learn to get kind of data. And they started the same way. They were both using textbooks. We helped them build their course. We helped them load a lot of the course details that they demonstrated. Get everything back. I mean, we've got the lectures, we've got the videos, we've got things that you've got those your exercises. The word tomorrow, the ship tomorrow, we're going to talk about curating open source content and how to do that within the tool. So it's pretty easy to bring a lot of that into the idea of staying tuned to um, your learning path, which at that point you start creating these assessments around it. Does that make um, sense? Let me be specific. I teach economics. Okay. What materials are there for an economics course? I, when I looked at what there is and I clicked on look for other resources, it said there's no other resources. So are, are, is our role here to populate those things for you? No, no not, not necessarily. What we've actually done for this boot camp, we paid uh, a gentleman who's in the economics department out at Cal State, uh, Cal Poly Pomona. He's created a full set of, he, of outcomes for uh, microeconomics. And then we've taken the OpenStax books and we've taken objectives of the, the outcomes from the OpenStax macroeconomics. So we have a full economics course we create for you. And then a lot of that What about all these quizzes and all that sort of stuff? You, you kind of create those out of the content you do them up. But then, but Julie, you want to take that? Well, I was just, I would say that um, you, you wouldn't be, so I'm Julie Schell. I'm, uh, I've been part of the design for Cafe Learn, but I'm not, I'm not selling Cafe Learn, so we put that out there. Um, what I'm, what I think the purpose is that you wouldn't be curating that resource 
system that is designed to maximize your students' learning. And there's, there's, where, you know, when you ask where's the content, I would say there's, there's tons of content. Just if you were starting, to, to starting a regular face-to-face -face course, there's tons of content that that exists that you could choose from. But to, uh, for myself, if I was going into, I, I don't know what you teach, but I teach technology class and an innovation class, and I wouldn't be able to use assessments that somebody else made, just copy them and use them. I would have to, I would like to get ideas from them, but I would have to modify them to fit with my, my own style of teaching. And I think that's what, what Cafe Learn is, is meant to do, is to help facilitate the, the curation of existing resources, but also help you customize it and tailor it for your own students and your own Wiley has a product, for example, that goes with their book. And the frustrating thing is that the instructor cannot control what kinds of questions are being asked of the student, and they cover the entire book. So if you're not going to use every little topic within the book, there's no control. And what it sounds like this product allows you to do is at least control what kinds of questions your students are being asked. And that's something that's different from anything that I've seen. So I like that. And you had a question as well? I, I was just going to say, actually, Blackboard Canvas Probably say 
So my course is on Blackboard, um, and I've just imported some, ha had, had the folks at Cafe Learn import some unit of it. So get you a, give me, really, a feel for how Cafe Learn might uh, solve some problems that Blackboard gives me. <laughs> um, so what I wanted uh, to give you a chance to do is to begin to think about how you might use this piece, this uh, feature of uh, adaptive assessment uh, formative and adaptive assessment in your course. So what I, you should all have some learning outcomes already or have some idea of what your learning outcomes would be. And what I wanted to uh, suggest for you to do or invite you to do is to choose one of those learning outcomes, identify a handful of performance expectations, what you would want students to do to show you that they've mastered that outcome, and then think about some rewind or fast forward activities. A student who is having trouble with one of those performance activities, what might you point them to, what resources, whether that's a, 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 an exercise, a YouTube video, uh, uh, something else, right, or something you might want to design yourself, um, and some fast-forward activities, <coughs> ones who are really nailing it. What can you do to step it up and make it more engaging for them? Just wanted to give you an opportunity to take a few minutes and talk with each other, brainstorm ideas about how you might use that feature. And again, you don't have to use it with Cafe Learn, right? You could do this in your class, uh, if it's, if it's, uh, even if you don't use this platform. It is. Yep. That's right. Yep. Yep. Who's in a group with other people? Who's at a table with other people that had a really great idea that you want to tell us about? Okay. Because. I, I would think that you should all be insulted that nobody wants to share your great idea. Yeah? Awesome. Let's hear it. All right. Well, I'm working on information literacy in our University 101 course. So in addition to my content, which is the world of work, um, you know, students need to understand how to read the library effectively and uh, electronic resources. So a rewind activity is, you know, some folks aren't even going to know how to log on, you know, online to see what the database is in the past. So we're talking about creating a video that logging on or what's the list of available databases. My fast forward would be, can you identify, you know, use the databases effectively enough to find five articles from academic peer-reviewed journals and five articles from the professional, you know, literature and, and use them appropriately in your final paper, right? And in between would be, can I just get 10, you know, citations or proper citations without the distinction between an academic peer-reviewed journal and a professional journal, so. That sounds really cool, yeah. Because you're thinking about what kind of things are people going to have trouble with. It's not going to be everybody. Not everybody needs the tutorial on how to log in, <laughs> right? But there are going to be some people, and you want to make that available for them when they have trouble. Yeah. Another, another uh, idea you want to share? No? No? Yeah, great. Awesome. So my fast forward would be for them to either at home they can use their webcam and perform and it's talking to students or giving them top-notch performance and then I would sort of evaluate it with that. Or rewind would be to look at a YouTube clip or word poet and then they'll have to ask questions and evaluate how the literary style connects to the message. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Awesome. One more? I have a question. Yes. seniors, big classes. I mean, you know, I, I got four or five hundred students a semester, so I can't do individual, you know, assessment. I, I just can't. You know. Yeah. And I don't have grad help, you know, right. that student, so. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that I am excited about this tool, mm -hmm. is that it allows for you to get the one-on-one -on -one it, it, it opens up possibilities for doing the one-on-one -on -one when you have a bunch of students. 
because I may not, if I had, if I had a critical thinking, so I did, I've done this, this model twice. In one model, I had 75 students, and then on one, I had 30 students. And you could guess right now which one worked more successfully, right? The 30-student classroom was much better because I had more one-on-one -on -one with each individual student. But um, having something that, having this rewind and fast-forward feature available on an online platform would allow the larger group to be able to get the individualized feedback that I'm able to do with the smaller group because they can see, they get the, it's graded by the machine, right? Yeah, automated for those and it's automatically yeah. tells them, here's what you need to practice rather than them having to wait until I score it and then tell them those are the exercises you need to do. Yeah, so I, I think it's got some real potential. So, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right.